your kingdom come. Good day, good evening, or whatever time you're joining us. Welcome to GET. Thank you for joining us today. We're so glad you made this your place of worship. Look, let's get right into the word today. We are in for a treat. I'll see you after the message. I'm going to read a scripture. We're going to do something a little different today. It's just an amazing day. I, I want to read a scripture um, that I believe uh, is befitting for the season that this church is in. I've always asked the Lord to just give us moments in which we can do things to represent him well. And then after we ask for those things, uh, then God provides opportunity, and then it's up to us to work the opportunity. It's up to us to work the opportunity. And so there's a scripture, uh, you know, as we, you know, are, we, we consider ourselves and have always considered ourselves the rapture preparation center, preparing, you know, for when the Lord comes, whenever that's going to be. Amen. And as we read scriptures and study, we'll find out how God wants us to be while we are waiting for him. Uh, you know, some people, when it comes to eschatology, you know, we kind of get lost and it's not what we think about. Um, I don't think about it as much as I think about what God wants me to do while I'm here. And so that's what's important to me. So I want to read it uh, in Matthew chapter 25, uh, verse 31. I want to read a few scriptures here to just share what Jesus is teaching uh, the people. Verse uh, 31 says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Ask your neighbor, which one are you, sheep or goats? <laughs> 34 says, then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Because we ain't seen you, and we ain't fed you. Or when were you thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick in prison and visit you? Because I ain't been to uh, Twin Towers. <laughs> Verse 40 says, and the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. And I just want to, for a, a brief second, brief second, because we're going to have somebody, uh, an amazing person to come share this year. Uh, I just want to just have a little topic called the least of these, all right? When in our churches, in our churches, uh, many times, and here I could speak at our church, you know, we've had a uh, wonderful missionary department that missionary department, excuse me, that were doing great things within the community. Uh, Evangelist Helen Woods, we know. Let's put our hands together for Dr. Helen Woods. If you're watching, I hope you got my message. If you don't, Sister Beaver's going to give it to you. Uh, but Evangelist Helen Woods lead our missionaries, and we would get together and do things, and God began to expand even as, as I became the pastor. And I told you all that one of the things that I asked the Lord to do, and I just said it a second ago, um, even b before Tracy called me with the opportunity at the church, I said, Lord, you know, having church is great. We know how to do that. We can get some of the greatest musicians, the greatest singers. We can have people smiling, the greatest greeters. But, Father, give our church and give me an opportunity to do something amazing 
on behalf of you in which I'm going to have to trust you. I'm going to have to lean on your guidance. I'm going to have to do what you called me to do. And the Lord began to do that. Uh, you know, as I asked for these opportunities, you know, Tracy called me about the opportunity to do what we do here on Tuesdays locally because I believe in doing things in the local community, uh, in the neighborhood in which we serve. And we've done great things as a church, feeding 3,000 people a, a month. Isn't that amazing? And I'm talking about individuals who, who need it. And so, uh, you know, when these opportunities come and God calls us, he calls us to be steadfast and uh, uh, diligent, and we have to be ambitious about the opportunities, right? And so I said, God, do what we're doing here. Now, bless us to do things uh, within the county of Los Angeles. Make ways, and God has been doing that. And I also said, uh, even as missionaries uh, do great things around the country, I said, God, give us an opportunity to be a blessing. Give me an opportunity to bless somebody that may not live here in this, on, on this soil. In the United States. And immediately when I asked God to do that, and then God said, I'm going to make it happen for you. And he called me to the table. And, and, and what me and my family have done is we decided to be a blessing to somebody overseas. Amen. And, and I'm excited about this opportunity. For those that don't know, in a few hours, I'm getting ready to fly to Africa. And I'm going to Rwanda. And I'm, this is the first time that I'm going. I'm a little half apprehensive, amen, but I'm excited at the same time, amen, because I'm one, y'all know, and y'all know your pastor. The pastor don't do no gimmicks. I don't do church games and all that stuff, and I don't believe in taking advantage of the people, amen. I believe that God will get those that take advantage of us. But when you ask God to put you in right partnerships, as we've been talking uh, about uh, the first week of this series, relationship goals and, and right relationships with people and how to collaborate with people to do great things, God will do that. And so today is a special day for you here because many of you all have never tapped into uh, what, what we're getting ready to show you today. Amen. And I understand. We see a lot of things on TV, but sometimes you got to get on the uh, boots on the ground to see the work that's being done. Amen. If, if, you, if you're one that stays home, let me tell you something. I dare you to go around your community and see the needs in your community. Amen. I promise you there is a way that you can help. Amen. And then when God does that for you, amen, you can see what's happening in your state, in your country, and even overseas internationally. And so today, uh, a very special friend is here today, and I just want him to share um, by the name Name, um, his name is Bernie Anderson, and he's going to come and share. He's a former pastor. He used to pastor for a long time, longer than I've been pastoring. <laughs> Amen. He lives in Orlando. But he is, is, is so exciting as we've been sharing over the phone the past few weeks. Amen. And the things that he's done, he does. Amen. Uh, he, he told me he, he, he climbed Mount Kilimanjaro over in, was in Tanzania. He climbed that mountain three times. And he invited me to come climb it the next time in September. And while I am adventurous, while I am adventurous, while I am adventurous, uh, I'm going to see if anybody wants to go with me to help me. <laughs> uh, Erica says she's going to pray my strength. <laughs> Amen. But, but, but he does, Bernie does things internationally, and I just want him to come this time. I want you, Grady Emanuel, to just put your hands together for my friend Bernie Anderson as he comes to just share with us this morning. Yeah. Wow. Pastor, thank you so much. And um, that's an open invitation. Anyone who wants to go climb Killy with me, uh, you're welcome to join us. And uh, it's, it's a, yeah, it's, it's quite an adventure. But I'd love to get your pastor. Y'all you, want to see that, right? Y'all want to see pastor on the mountain? Very good. Wow, what an honor to be with you. Um, G-E-T. Um, wow, what a, you know, I, I'm a bit of a church junkie, I'll tell you that. I love church. I grew up uh, going to um, Greater Paradise Missionary Baptist Church, Little Rock, Arkansas. That's where I grew up. And I've been in church, it feels like I've been in church my entire life. And God, it, God called me to, into pastoral ministry. Uh, when I was about 15 years old, I sensed God saying, I want you to be my guy in the church. And uh, so I pastored for about 23 years. And 
Um, but I, I'm a church junkie. I'm always, I watch churches all the time. I follow pastors all the time. I, um, I meet with, pa- I met with three pastors yesterday um, here in California. I, I live in Orlando, Florida, but I knew I was coming. I said, let me connect with these guys. And so, but this church is special. Thank you uh, for who you are. Um, your past, yes, amen, yes, celebrate that, man. And um, in my role at World Vision, I am, uh, I lead, I'm, I'm the director of church engagement. So church is just kind of my thing, you know, and um, um, I've raised three, da- I have three daughters, three amazing daughters. Um, their names are Madison, Brooklyn, and Liberty. <laughs> now, now what city are they named after, my friends? In New York, yes, thank you. Um, so those are my daughters. They are, they are adult-ish. Um, they are, they're getting there. They're not quite there. 27, 24, and 21. Um, I just love them to death. Uh, amazing young ladies, but they're still on my payroll, so that's why they're adult-ish, right? We're getting there. We're getting there. Um, and then my wife and I, this is, this is a very, very special year for us. My wife and I will celebrate 30 years of marriage. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you. This August, 30 years, and I have the, I got the trip booked, getting it all planned, and uh, looking forward to, we're going on a cruise, so the lady's going on a carnival cruise, we're going on a cruise as well, uh, and looking forward to that, but um, I told her, if you, if you leave me, honey, I'm going with you, so. <laughs> That's how that works, she stuck with me. Uh, but such an honor to be here, and uh, pastor 12 years, man, congratulations. Give it up for your pastor again. That's, um, that's amazing. That's so powerful. I've always said that uh, when a pastor can stay in one place for a long time, that's a, uh, that's a powerful, that's a valuable ministry, because they see you through all the phases, man. You, you get through the honeymoon period where everybody likes you. You go through the, the middle part where nobody likes you. And then it comes back around and everybody loves you again because they just say, well, we stuck with them now. So, so you know, it seems, seems like that's kind of how it goes. But uh, I do have a few moments to spend with you, and I'm grateful for that. And um, I just want to share uh, a bit about who, you know, what I get to do and how I get to serve, but more importantly about how God is using uh, the work of World Vision to serve some of the most vulnerable communities in the world. And your pastor is going to get to go and be in Rwanda in a couple of those communities uh, this week, and it's really, really, really going to be powerful. But I want to take you to a passage of Scripture, if you will. It'll be familiar to you, um, and we're going to pick up in, um, in Luke chapter 10, the Gospels. Uh, it'll be uh, a parable that will sound extremely familiar, and we'll just read it together. That'll do a little bit more. We'll give you a little bit of background, and, and we'll, we'll land the plan here fairly quickly. But let's read it together, G-E-T. Is that okay? Let's read it together. But a Samaritan as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Now, we've all watched films or we've watched movies, and there are oftentimes in the opening scene of a movie, the film doesn't give you context. They just throw you a scene and something happens. You're kind of going, well, what on earth is going on? And so what we've just done is sort of entered a a scene. We don't have the full context of what's going on, but we're going to spend a little time and we'll come forward to that. We'll back up a little bit, and I'll begin to frame it, and we'll bring it context in just a little bit. But I want to tell you about my mother. I want to put a photo up of my mother, Um, amazing woman. Um, I I love her to death, obviously. She's she's incredible. Uh, Thankfully, I still have my mother. I still have both of my parents are still alive. Um, But she's been a nurse for as long as I can remember, since I was just a little kid. In fact, I remember when she went to nursing school, and... um, this is her getting pinned as a nurse. And there's something that I watched my mother do years ago, just when I was just a little boy. And it has made an imprint on me uh, ever since. And it's shaped the way I think about uh, ministry. It's shaped the way I think about uh, even the character of God and who he is and how God relates to us. 
But it's especially shaped the way um, I believe God wants us to serve and love vulnerable people. And I believe it emerges from this passage. We'll, we're going to get to the Good Samaritan, but I believe what, what we'll see is that it is a connection between this story about my mother, but also, more importantly, how the passage uh, teaches us how to serve those who are vulnerable. So my mother, um, my mother took me, I had to go with my mom to a, to a funeral, to a little country church in rural Arkansas in August. It was hot. It was hot, it was humid, and just a little country church. All the windows in this little church were up. Uh, we didn't have any air conditioning. It was jam-packed. This was a black funeral, y'all. And we're in the South. And um, I'll never forget it as long as I live. Just a little guy. And um, that's the last place I wanted to be, right, as, as a little kid. But I had to be there. As a distant relative, I'm not even sure who the relative was. But as it uh, as it goes in the experience of a black funeral, uh, there's a lot of eulogizing. There's a, the preaching and the moaning and the, um, the, 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 inter, the, the eulogizing and the, uh, everything that goes with the black experience in a funeral, you can imagine that's what was happening. In the heat, the summer heat of Arkansas, and uh, we were sweating. We were, everybody's fanning. You just grab whatever you can fan. A lot of the fans that had the the picture of Dr. King on him. Y'all remember those fans? Yeah. And I'll never forget, as this service is winding down and, and um, it's coming to a close, and it comes to a close and everyone's beginning to file out, and there's an old, older gentleman, there's just one aisle, center aisle, then it wasn't big enough for two, it was just one center aisle. My mother and I were seated towards the back, and this older gentleman begins to make his way down the center aisle towards us. And I see him, and my mother and I see him, and he just kind of wobbles and staggers and falls to the floor. And my nurse mother immediately runs to, to his care. She, I mean, it was like in an instant. She was by his side, and she had him on his back, and she's beginning to assess him and understand what's going, try to figure out what's going on with him. And then she proceeded to do this. I think I'd maybe seen this on television somewhere or something as a little kid. She, um, she positioned his, his, his head in such a way to open his airway. And she pinched his nose. And she placed her mouth on his mouth. And she began to breathe into this man's mouth. She pinched, she adjusted the head, pinched the nose, placed her mouth, and began what they called back in the day, y'all know what this is, mouth to mouth resuscitation. And I'm sitting here watching my mother as she just without hesitation proceeds to minister or to give aid to this man who is in need. I'll never forget it as long as I live. And there she was with, I mean, just, just doing all the things, chest compressions. She blowing, blowing. And I remember watching this as a little boy. My eyes are wide open. I go, what on earth, right? And I saw I saw this saliva begin to trickle down the man's face. <laughs> and there was a part of me that kind of said, ooh, mom. And you're going to want to kiss me later with them, you know. Like, Come on now. That's... But my mother stayed with that man. And she, she, she did everything she needed to do. She got him. So by the time the, the emergency personnel were on the scene, she had the man stabilized. She had saved his life. She had saved his life. Now, it profoundly affected me even as a, even as a young boy because I watched as my mother literally, she blew, she breathed into this man's, uh, in, into his mouth and, and his, his chest began to raise and she, she, helped his, she helped his heart keep beating with those chest compressions. She did all these things, and it was profound. And so it's, it's really, it's touched me in such a way that I've arrived at a, um, at, at a certain truth about this life and even about who God is and, and how we are to serve people. You know, it's funny, I think back, I'm not sure what my mother's spiritual status was in that moment. I don't know if she was saved, unsaved. I don't know, I was too young to really understand that. Um, I knew that we went to church on Christmas and Easter, but I don't know any, anything besides that. But what I 
do know that in those moments, my mother was discipling me. She was discipling me on mercy and what it means to be a neighbor to someone in need, what it means to serve someone who's vulnerable in, in a life or death situation. What should you do? And so it's led me to this truth. I want to put it on the screen for you. In order to serve, in order to serve people who are in need, to serve those in need, we must respond. Now get this. We must respond with intimacy and action. All right, I know. That, that word intimacy is kind of provocative, but hang with me. It's, it's accurate too, right? Because I want you to think about what my mother did in those moments when that man was on his back and in desperate need. First of all, she saw him. I saw him. You ever, you ever notice that it's, there's a difference between seeing and looking? <laughs> and she saw him and she saw, she, th there are people who look at things, they look at situations. It's like the people on the road, on the highways, right? When an accident happens, we call them looky-loos. <laughs> you ever heard of looky-loo, right? And those, those are the people that are they, they're turning their necks to see what has gone on. How bad is the situation? You know, is there blood and guts everywhere? <laughs> those are the looky-loos, right? There are people who can look at something but not really see. And I believe that God calls Christ followers and those of us who claim to be Christians to be more than just looky-loos when it comes to broken people. We're called to be those who see. And so my mom saw, she could see this man. And then she, she got up and she moved toward the man. And she got close to the man. Thus the word intimacy. It means to get close. In order to serve those who are broken, those who are desperate and in need, you cannot do it from a distance. We cannot serve the vulnerable from afar. We have to draw near. And then it's not enough simply to see and to draw near in intimacy and to get close. I mean, again, my mother placed her lips up upon that man's lips. She touched him. The saliva, I'm sure, got on her mouth too. She saw, she moved close, there was an intimacy there, but then she had to use the skill set that God himself had given her to bring aid to the man, to take action, to serve him, to ultimately save his life. And so God was moving in those moments upon the hearts of this little kid as I was watching that. And this is a statement that I've come up with. This is the truth that I believe, that God, um, God operates this way that in order for us to serve those who are broken and in need, we have to move close and we have to do something. This is the way that God operates. This is what I've been convicted about who God is. And Psalms chapter 12 and verse 5 even backs me up. So look at it there. Psalm chapter 12 and verse 5, it says this. You can read it with me. The Lord replies, I have seen violence done to the helpless. I have heard, God sees, God sees. I have seen violence done to the helpless. I have heard the groans of the poor. Now I will rise up to rescue them as they have longed for me to do. God sees. God hears. God gets up from his seat and he draws close. And he rescues. And he saves. Can't you relate to that? You can, you can identify with the notion of needing God to hear you where you are. You may not have been on your back in a pew in a little country church in hot rural Arkansas, but you've been down. You've been down. You've been, you've been desperate. You've cried out to God. You've been broken. You've been wondering whether or not you're going to breathe. You've breathed your last breath. And you cried out to God and he heard you. And he came to your side, saliva and all. God came to you. He heard your voice, and he rescued you. So God sees us, man. God understands our pain. God understands 
our brokenness. And this same God wants us to see and understand and to draw near and to hear the pains and the brokenness of those of our brothers and sisters that live in some of the most vulnerable spaces in the world. And yes, they live right here in your very community. And thank you for feeding 3,000 people a month, G-E-T. Yeah. Thank you for seeing the people in your community and in your neighborhood. Thank you for what you do. You've, you've built a well somewhere. Where was the well, Pastor? In Kenya? You built a well in Kenya. Thank you for pro providing clean water to our brothers and sisters who live in that vulnerable community. Thank you for that. I'm grateful for a God who sees and hears, because I want you to hear this. Every day about a 1,000 children under the age of five die due to diarrheal disease attributed to poor water, sanitation, and hygiene. Can you imagine that? I've had two water bottles this morning, both of them half full, right? I've drunk half. We have them around our house. We end up throwing them away. And yet there are people in this world who do not have access to clean water. There are a 1,000 children almost every day that die because they drink dirty water. That just should not be. That just should not be. There are about 800 million people in this world today that still lack access to clean drinking water. And again, I, it doesn't even, it's not even something that even phases us that we can get clean water. We buy it by the cases. And then, due to COVID, for the first time in 30 years, we're seeing an overall increase in extreme poverty. And that's people that live on less than $2 a day. That's about $1.90 a day. We live in a world where there's, there's still the crying out, there's still the groaning, there's still the, the violence being done to the helpless, and the God says, hey, will my church, in the same way that I hear the crying and the moaning and the groaning, will my church, will my people also hear it? Will they rise up and rise up with me and respond to those who are in desperate need? So let me take you back to the story of the Good Samaritan, right? We caught it. All, we caught the scene already happening. That was the opening scene. We're going to give it a little bit more context. Let's put the passage back up. We'll read it real quick again. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, read it with me. Come on, G-E-T. Came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds. Do you hear it? Pouring on oil and wine, intimacy and action. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. So what is going on? What happens before the but? Well, Jesus encounters, um, some of your translations will say a lawyer. He's an expert in the law, but not a courtroom lawyer. He is a, um, he's an expert in the Torah or Jewish law. And so he encounters this expert in the law, and he asks Jesus two vital questions, two incredibly important questions. He says, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? Essentially, he's asking, what must I do to be saved, right? That's how you and I would translate that. Um, and so, and then he says, you know, what must I, he says, what must I do to be saved, or what must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? And Jesus responds in a very significant way. He says, look, you're the expert in the law. How do you read Torah? How do you understand it? How do you interpret it? And the man says, um, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, yes, you're right. You, you really do know the Torah. Very good. Um, do this and you will be saved. And then he has a follow-up question, though. In an effort to sort of throw Jesus off, his follow-up question is this, and who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And then Jesus begins to tell the story. And Jesus says there was a man, he was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell amongst thieves, and they beat him till he was half dead. And then Jesus says two religious people came along. It was a priest and a Levite. The priest came along, and he walked really, really, really far around. He saw, or he, he looked 
He looked, but he did not go any closer, and he walked on around. Then he says the priest came along. Jesus says the priest came along, and he looked, and he kept on moving. And then our passage, but, but a Samaritan came along, and he saw. And do you hear the theme, intimacy in action? What does he do? He moves in close. But the Samaritan, but the Samaritan, he moves in close. When he saw him, he took pity on him, a very deep, compassionate pity, something that moved the Samaritan. It hit him hard. He could not leave the scene without doing something. And he moves in, and he bandages the wounds, and he pours on the oil and the wine, and he, and he does all the, he puts the man on his donkey, takes him to an inn, and he leaves his credit card for incidentals. <laughs> there's an intimacy and an action that you see there. There's, a, there's this power that, that Jesus describes about what it means to serve those who are vulnerable. And then Jesus has this wonderful moment where he comes back and he ends with his own question, right? Jesus comes around and he says this, which of these three was a neighbor to the man? And the expert in the law says, the one who had mercy. And then Jesus finishes the story by saying, going, by saying this, go and do likewise. Go and do the same. Go get close. First of all, see it. Go get close and go take action to make a difference to those who are vulnerable. So we, I serve at World Vision. I've been there about six years. We're a 70-year-old organization. We operate in about 100 different countries. We operate in some of the most fragile, the most difficult, the most um, rural contexts in the world. We call them, actually call them fragile states where there's political instability, there's conflict, there's violence. Every, anything that you can imagine that would keep a child from thriving and experiencing fullness of life, that is where we operate. That is where we do our work in the name of Jesus. And we work really, really, really hard to put down a false narrative that we've all heard. If we haven't heard it, we've at least felt it at some level. But there's a narrative that says, if you have less, then you are less. If you have less, then you are less. And we work very, very hard not to, to tear down that, that thinking, to remove that stereotype, to, to shatter that false narrative that if you have less, you are less. In fact, we affirm the inherent dignity of every person, whether they have a lot or whether they have a little. We believe that God sees you, that you're created by God that you're loved and valued by God. And we want you to experience fullness of life. And so my wife and I, for the last, uh, last several years, we've been um, partnered with World Vision and connecting to a little boy by the name of Lumino. And uh, he lives in Zambia. And I wanna put his picture up as well. Um, he is uh, just an awesome young man. That's pictures several, yes, 2019. He is, I think if you go to the next picture, he is, uh, he's 17 and he'll turn 18, I believe, in, in May. And my wife and I sponsor Lumino through World Vision. And uh, sponsorship for Lumino means that he gets clean water. He gets access to clean water. His community gets access to clean water. Um, it means that he gets access to education, health care. Uh, his family will be uh, empowered around economic development. Um, and when, as we sponsor Lumino, there are four other children that are also impacted because of our sponsorship of Lumino. And so as your pastor um, has been talking about, when opportunity arises, he says, listen, I wanna, God's gonna give us the opportunity, then we have to work it out, I think is his language. We have to work it out. And so what I wanna do this morning is because um, there's a, two communities in Rwanda. Your pastor's gonna visit one of those communities. I wanna invite you to move close. I want you to see, but I want you to move close to a child 
that lives in extreme poverty in Rwanda. I want to invite you to join and partner with World Vision, just like my wife and I do, and sponsor a child um, monthly. It's $39 a month to sponsor a child. And just like with the child that I sponsor, my wife and I sponsor, it's, it, it's clean water. It's all the things that that child needs to begin to experience fullness of life. Now, I'm even going to tell, give you specific communities, these specific communities, so you can be praying also over these communities. So if we go to the next slide, um, these are the two communities in Rwanda that your church that we're partnering with this morning, and the names of those communities are difficult to say, but I'm going to try. Ijohiza and Jayambiri. Ijohiza and Jayambiri. And I believe, Pastor, you're going to Ijohiza, or it might be Jayambiri. I don't know, but you're going to Rwanda. But I want to invite you to partner with us, to join in this movement, to come alongside of vulnerable children in Rwanda. Now, historically, World Vision, we've been doing this for years, but God spoke to us very clearly recently about how we could maybe do something to more, um, to affirm, to be even more intentional about affirming the inherent dignity of every child. And so, typically, the way that we would invite you to sponsor a child is we would uh, have you go out into the lobby, or we would have volunteers walk around with these little packets. Um, you might see some packets hanging in the lobby, or we would hand them out. And they would have the picture of a child on it, and it had the name of that child, the country they live in. It would have all this information about this child, have their birthday, and maybe something unique about what they like. And you would get to choose. You'd have an opportunity to, to choose a child. But God's been speaking to us specifically about what it would look like to, to maybe change that whole thing and what it would look like if we reversed that process and rather than us choosing the child, perhaps we could empower children who live in extreme poverty, who don't have, who don't get choice, who take life as it comes to them. What if they were empowered to choose us? What if we reverse the whole power dynamic and children got to choose us? So I want to show you this video. Let me be filled with kindness and compassion for the one. Yes, yes, yes. I love it. So this is what's happening. On Wednesday in Rwanda, in Ijohiza or Jayamberi, there's going to be a party. That party is going to be the Greater Emmanuel Temple Choosing Party. Yes, you're hosting a party in another country for some of the most amazing children in the world. And those children are going to show up with these big smiles on their faces because they know that their brothers and sisters here in Los Angeles have taken photos and they've sent their photos over and those photos are gonna be of you. So this morning, if you want to be a part of that choosing party, I'm inviting you to sign on to sponsor a child. You're gonna go out in just a little bit, you're gonna go out into the lobby and take the most amazing photo of your life because you're hosting a party in Rwanda. What cooler thing could you do than host? And those children are gonna be empowered to walk up and they're gonna see your faces. So take a good picture. 
and they're going to see you, and they're going to get have an opportunity to choose you. Then they're going to sit down before they get on to the rest of the party, and they're going to write a letter to you. And that letter is going to say why they chose you, why they saw you, and why they chose you. And those are the greatest letters ever. And so um, I'm excited for that, and I just pray in my heart is that you would partner with us and join us. But uh, Pastor is going to come back and share a little bit more about it. Put your hands together for my friend, Bernie Anderson. So, so let me just, again, let me just give some context and we're gonna pray. First of all, I'm excited because we have a couple people that's gonna be baptized today, actually, all right? Um, and I wanna say a special prayer over what we're getting ready to do. Again, y'all know me. I'm not a guy, the smoke and mirrors don't turn me one way or, the, or another. But again, I'm very serious about opportunity. Somebody shout opportunity. And what God did for me when I met the wonderful people here at World Vision, um, I made a decision for my family to sponsor a young child. All right? And so I took a photo. And we sent a photo so that a young person can choose our family. Again, we... Like, like Bernie said, I don't know how many bottles of water you opened just to take a sip of and left there. It's a pet peeve of mine, actually, when I walk around home, church, anywhere, when I see a bottle and it's full with water and just this much was drinking, drank out of it, you know? And so to be a part of what's happening, I want you all to do this. This is what I call real mission work. And the Lord allowed us to connect with this, this group of people, amen, because... Trust me, many of y'all don't want to do the leg work. You don't want to go. You don't want to get out there and find what's happening. And God allows individuals that have it as a passion in their heart to, to do this. And then it allows us opportunities to connect with them. So I want y'all today to meet me in the lobby, those that want to take a picture. And we're going to have this choosing party. I'm going to be there, and I'm going to be taking pictures and sending it to the WhatsApp so y'all can see what's happening so that y'all can know. Amen. And then next Sunday when we come back, we're going to find out who was chosen and who's going to be a part of it. So isn't that, ama isn't that an amazing opportunity? Such an amazing opportunity. But this is what I want us to do. I want us y'all to stand. I want you all to stand. Church, church is over. I do want to say this. After church, after church, uh, there's going to be choir rehearsal. For those that's going to sing in the choir, after you take your pictures, for those that's going to sing, and I might even sing tenor just a little bit. I don't even think we might even convince Rob to come sing tenor. <laughs> he like, nah. <laughs> he like, nah. But, but listen, I want, I want you all to pray. I want you all to pray for us as we get ready to go uh, and leave to go out of the country. But I want you all to listen. Listen, the last thing I'll say, I want you to pray about this opportunity. And I'm doing, I'm doing it. I'm the first one to do it. I'm never going to ask you all to do anything that I don't do. Amen. And then I believe that God is going to bless us. Amen. So those that's going to be baptized, and we're going to be in the Learning Center, and we're going to baptize today. Amen. And for everybody else that's here, amen, look to somebody and say, we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity. I want you to tap in with us. Bow your heads, if you will. Father, in the name of Jesus. I thank you for this day. I thank you for this time. I thank you for this opportunity. Lord, you know I asked for it. And Lord, you brought an opportunity to me. Now, Father, I ask for strength as I get ready to dive into it, as I get ready to travel a long way, Father, just to see what you would have us to do. I pray, Father, that all of us here at GET, however we're moving, Father, touch our hearts. Give us strength for decisions that we have to make, that we may be a blessing not only to our community, because we do take care of home first, but we take care of other places, amen, as you give us opportunities. And God, I thank you for it. Father, I pray that you bless everyone here, everyone that was in service today. I thank you for the worship, the word that has gone forth. I thank you for this season that you are bringing us to and the opportunities for what we do within the community and abroad. Bless us, God. Bless us to be an example. We thank you for these opportunities. Go before us this week. Let us have an amazing week, Father. Let there be protection, amen, from your angels. Everywhere we go, as we travel up and down the freeways, the streets, Father, as our kids go to school, as individuals go to work, or even as we stay home, Father, bless everybody wherever they are. And we'll give your name the praise and glory. Somebody shout in Jesus' name. Amen. What a powerful 
an exceptional message we just heard today. If you would like to share your prayer request at the email below, our pastor and prayer team will be glad to pray for you. And we expect God to do amazing things. Have a blessed week. Thank you for joining us today. If this is your first time, welcome to GET. Bienvenidos. Our hope is that you enjoy today's worship experience. You can find five ways to give right at the bottom of the screen. Help us continue the work and be a blessing to God's people. Stay tuned for all the upcoming events happening at GET. Are going to be bringing you generations of legacy where we have the wise and the mature in a conversation about how our history is important to move us forward so what I want you to do is come dressed and whatever represents black history to you and we will see you there February the 25th right after service don't leave it's gonna be amazing Bible study is different. Have you heard? It's reset season. We're taking on the books of the Bible week by week. You don't want to miss this new approach to the books of the Bible. Join us online live Wednesdays at 7 p.m. See you there. GET ladies, get ready to pack your bags and sail away for our Women's Ministry Carnival Cruise. We'll be taking a cruise trip to Baja, Mexico on September the 6th. Save the date. Be sure to see Dr. Tracy Allen by March 16th to reserve your spot. All right, we'll see you on the cruise ship. Happy Black History Month, GET. Wishing you and your family a wonderful, safe celebration all month long. Thanks again for joining us today. We are so happy you made this your place to work. As our pastor always says, love God, love people, love yourself.